1 Corinthians chapter 3. And I, brethren, <clears throat> talking to say, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. Imagine calling yourself the Corinth Baptist Church after chapter 3, verse 1, 2, and 3. Would that be so great? He says, you guys are carnal. And go get this. I got to treat you in carnality to get you spiritual. Well, I know a church is spiritual. They went back to carnality and went back to spiritual. Does. You're not to be, just by verse 1, if we were to end the chapter right now, what's it saying? You're not to be carnal. Carnival. You know what goes on in a carnival? You know what goes on the, the cruise ships the, by that name of carnival? Anything but Christ-like. Anything that God wants us to do. And this church is carnal. I have fed you with milk. And not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it. Neither yet now are ye able. Wow. They still haven't even grown. And what is milk? Jesus was, was born of a virgin. He helped others. He died on the cross. That's all milk. There's nothing about revelations and prophecies. And we're gonna, we'll, sooner or later we're going to get into the gifts. Man, they blew those gifts far and wide right out of the water. Thinking there's somebody who they're not. And as we go through 1 Corinthians, see the carnality that Paul is dealing with them. And then look around at your church, ma'am or sir. And the church that you attend, if it's got the things that are in the current church right now, you need to grow. And Paul says, I've fed you with milk. 1 Peter 2, 2, Hebrews 5, 13. And we read in the book of Acts, he stayed there for a while. God told him to stay there for a while to them to grow. Neither yet now are ye able. And I say this with, 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 there are people who are born the way they're born. But these people are spiritually retards. They've got to have someone to keep spoon feeding them. For ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you Evian, so envy is a sign of carnality. And strife, fights, battling. Strife in a church is carnality. And divisions. And we read that in the previous chapter too. You know, I like this preacher. I like that preacher. I like this hymns. I like these hymns. I don't like the color of these walls. I don't like the color of this carpet. Are ye not carnal? And ready? And walk as men. So you, when you do what men do, you're doing carnality. Because it's supposed to be what God wants. God and man are two far ends of the scale as far as you can get when you're comparing any kind of righteousness which man doesn't have. They've taken the position of man and not God. And again, for one says, I am Paul. And another, I am Apollos. Are you not carnal? They got their favorites. Who then is Paul? Who am I? Who is Paulos? But ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. We're just, you know, we're just ministers. We're not gods. We're not important. I have planted. This goes back to the seed bearer and Mark and Matthew. I have planted. Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. 
Okay, yeah, I planted seeds, Paul's came along and watered them, but it's God that saved you, not us. We just put the gospel out there. You go outside and put a seed in the ground, you, you bury it, and then you water it. It's God going to bring that plant up, not you. If there would ever be a plant. It may not be a plant. So then neither is he that planteth anything. I, the evangelist that came through our church. Eh, he's nothing. Neither the waterer. Well, we had a missionary come through and, and then people. So. But God that giveth the increase. It's all about God. God is the common of Christians. Not the preacher, not the evangelist, not the missionary. But he that planteth and he that watereth are one. Well, look at that. You can't say, well, you know, uh, Paul's message got me going. But when Paul's came, I finally dedicated my heart. No, Paul and Paul's were one. And it looks like according to this, when it, when it comes to dealing with people's souls, there's always a two-fold measure. Somebody's got to plant that seed. Because someone can come along and water all they want. If there's no seed, it ain't going to do you no good. Somebody's got to plant that seed. If no one comes around to water that seed, that seed is going to dry up and die anyway. And the main purpose is when God brings that seed life. But the one that planted and watered, they're together. They earned the same rewards of that one that got saved. Isn't God gracious? And every man that receiveth of his own reward according to his own labor. Yeah, a guy could leave a gospel track in the bathroom that he just visited. In a public bathroom somewhere. Right? Just, you know, he does his business, leaves a track. A guy gets up, you know, he's, he, you know, he reads it. Okay, and a seed been planted, and then sometime down the road you get this preacher, evangelist, whoever, and he's working on this message. God's working on his heart. He gets up that pulpit, and that man that was reading that track that was in the bathroom is in the congregation, and he hears that message that God has sent him to preach, and he gets up and he gets saved. Well, who is it credited to? Both, but there's also you know. I just left it in the in the in the stall. There's effort there, but the one that prayed about the message, the one that sought God for the message, he's going to get a little more. Whereas you know you, you deal with someone, you're opening up the Bible with them, and you're praying as you deal with them. You're trying, you're trying, you're trying. You plant the seed, and there's nothing. I mean, nothing goes along. And somebody comes along and says, "Hey, you know," they say one or two words or a sentence or, yeah. And he gets saved. Well, you're both one. You're both together. And a lot of times you're not even going to remember who that seed planter was. But you better remember it was God and put that notch on God and not on your belt. For we are laborers together with God. Well, look at that. Take my yoke, Jesus said. Is it really hard, so hard witnessing to people? Is it difficult? There's so many ways you can do it. I mean, if you don't like to talk, you got gospel tracts. If you don't like to meet new people, I mean, there's so many things you can do. But we are working with God when we're involved of witnessing to lost people. And here trying to get carnal Christians grown. Christians whatever age to grow them up ye are God's husbandry what was the first occupation of man ever to be found in the Bible Adam was to be a husbandman of the garden that he put that God put him in so when you're going back to trying to tell people about the gospel and trying to witness to implant those seeds you're going back to where Adam was Ye are God's, well, look at that, buildings. 
People go to a church, and that's their church. And you can have people who are soul win, who witness, and try to do stand outside that building, and God said, that's my building. They're the ones out there trying to get the supplies for the church. The Bible says that the church is made up of the people. The church is not finished yet. I don't know where the church stands. When the rapture happens, the last person will be put into the church. Right now, there may be holes in the roof. There may be windows missing. There may be planks missing. I don't know. But the church is not completely finished with people. And yet, all around this world, we've got plenty of churches that are done as far as wood, hay, uh, bricks, concrete, metal, siding. Those churches are done. But the body of Christ ain't done. It needs more people going out there to finish the work. God knows who's all going to be saved. Now, I'm not going to get into that Calvin doctrine. But God knows. And the very fact is the rapture has not happened yet. Means the church is still not finished. And when it's finished, it will be God's building. It's God's building right now, unfinished. And there are some men out there, there are some women out there who are trying to go out and build the church for God. Not for notches, not for credits, not for people to look at, but for God, for their souls to get out of hell. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me, Paul. So God gives grace. As a wise master builder, you realize how many souls Paul has brought into the building? I had laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. So the, anybody who gets saved today, they're on that foundation, they're on that church that Paul built. And you can see this is a spiritual application. This is not a literal church. But it's people. But let every man take heed how he builds thereupon. You're saved. You're part of the body of Christ. Don't bring no junk into the church. Don't bring any termites into the church. Don't bring any cancer into the church. Don't bring anything that's going to decay the church, which is happening today. Because decay, cancer, and all that other rubbish and rot and bugs and has infested the church today, and the church is sick. Be careful you're not one of them people. There's nowhere it says in the Bible to bring a lost man in the church. A lost man should feel uncomfortable in a Bible-believing church. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ is the base of the church and upon that base Paul has started building framework for Jesus now as far as an individual we're going to get into spiritual application now if any man build upon this foundation Jesus Christ gold silver precious stones wood hay or stubble now, don't go down to the jewelers. Don't go down to Home Depot and start buying this stuff and bring it to your pastor and say, look, I brought gold, silver, hay, and all that. That's not what it's talking about. <clears throat> These six items are your life after you receive Christ. The moment you receive Jesus Christ and are adopted into the Father as a child of God through the Holy Spirit and receive the Comforter, you are now on a building program and God has up in heaven a book recording of everything you're doing everything and they fall in the six classifications gold silver precious stones wood hay and stubble excuse me stubble everything in your entire life from your new birth to rapture or death, it's gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or stone. 
every man's work, see, every man's work, every Christian shall be made manifest. It's going to be open before. Why did you do it? What was the true motive? Why did you go knocking on doors? Why did you put money in the collection plate? Why were you friends with the pastor? Why did you talk about the people like that? Why did you change the Bible? Why did you spend more money on pet food than you did on God? Why you went where you went? Why you did what you did? Why you saw what you saw? Why you heard what you heard? Why you tasted what you tasted? Why, why you touched what you touched? Why your feet took you where you went? The who, what, where, why, when, and then all the senses of your life and your doings will be made manifest. If you kept the secret against your spouse, it will be made manifest in verse 13. Before all. If your pastor thought you were a very good person, holy and all that, and you weren't, it will be made manifest before all. For the day shall declare it. What day is that? That's the day of the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. Because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. So, your entire life, those six things that are written in God's book, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stove, all of it, whatever you accumulated in your life goes right between you and God, Jesus Christ. Piled up. I don't know what, what, what denominations, I don't know what substances, but everything is between you and Jesus Christ alone. And fire comes down. And the fire shall try every man's work. If any man's work abide which he has built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Now, gold, silver, precious stones do not burn. Silver and gold are made pure through fire. I'm not sure about precious stones, what fire would do with them. So when that fire comes down, you remember places where fire came down in the Bible? Sodom, Gomorrah, pfft, all ashes. I think there's one time in the wilderness, fire came down. Ashes. At the judgment seat of Christ, fire comes down, and then the smoke clears. If there are substance left, whether gold or silver or precious stones or gold and silver, or whether combination, if there's something left, you have the opportunity of four crowns, the fifth crown for people who are in the ministry. That will be to your reward. If there's gold, silver, precious stones, whatever, how many, Christ will put a crown upon your head. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Gold is a symbol of the king, Jesus Christ, king. Silver is the price of redemption, the buyback. Precious stones, we just, no, when we read that, and we read that in our family reading today. We are lively stones, Peter says. A, a precious stone, uh, the pearls that are the gates of New Jerusalem, they are living organism. Precious stones, we see rubies. A wife is, uh, is so much better than rubies. Stones represent people. The name of the 12 tribes that was on Aaron's uh, chest. And he had two stones on his shoulders, representing the 12 tribe. It's a representative people. Gold, I would assume, and uh, this is probably a study. I, I, I got it. I should go right back with my family and do it again. I love doing this. I do this over and over. Gold would be everything you've done for Jesus Christ, the King. You did it for no other reason but just for Jesus. Silver. You put the effort in for people to be redeemed by God. Precious stones, those that were saved because of your work. Now, you get dead. 
If any man's work abide, he that hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. How about God giving you a reward? Really? Why did I deserve a reward? Isn't pulling me out of hell enough? If not forgiving all my sins, for whatever reason, he forgive my sins, and I'm not worthy, he's going to give me a reward? I ought to sit on the on the edge of the lake of fire with my with my feet dangling in the lake of fire just for the sinfulness and rebelliousness of God I've shown him. Never mind New Jerusalem. And with all that, he's gonna give me a reward for suffering for him. If any man's work shall be burned, wood burns. Hay burns. Stubble burns. Wood makes paper. Money. Stocks. Houses. Boats. Hay. That's part of a horse food. Pet food. Stubble. That's just nothing. Can't do nothing much with stubble. So every man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, no reward. So don't go think, oh, all people will be saved in the end. Or don't even think, all people are going to get a crown in heaven. No. If any man's work which he had built thereupon, he sh shall receive reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. You ain't going to have your soul damned at the judgment seat of Christ. You're going to heaven. If you're saved, born again Christian, and you have this wood, hay, or stubble, that's it. Nothing survives that fire. You're going into New Jerusalem, but you're not going in with reward. You're not going to get a millennial inheritance with Jesus Christ. Now, how's that? How about eternal loss of not your soul, but a reward? I get busy doing something that God wants me to do. I don't know how it would be like to be in heaven and have somebody not have crowns. Because there's no more envy. How do you look at somebody and oh, I don't know why he's, he can see the top of his head. Now know ye not that ye are the temple of God. So you got churches out there with Baptist temple in their name. That's not the temple of God. I guarantee if you got temple in your church name, whatever denomination you are, you got lost people in that in that temple. That's God? Really? And that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. I'm saved. I am God's temple. I have the Holy Spirit indwelling in me. I am now building a foundation of whatever goods see fit. I guarantee wood, hay, or stubble will be there for me. I guarantee that. Gold, silver, precious stones, I don't know what I can guarantee on that. And you remember what, what Solomon's temple was? How it was garnished with gold. And stones and it was just a beautiful thing when God sees his Christians when he looks down from heaven he looks down well what's he see does he see a temple beautiful or does he see an old abandoned shack walking around that will burn up a fire hazard it's been quite hard to burn Solomon's temple But they did burn him. It took a lot of effort. If any man defile the temple of God, that's yourself, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy. Which temple are ye? You holy or unholy? Right there could be some reasons why some people have diseases, sicknesses, pains, sorrows, and troubles. 
because you're destroying your own body. You're doing things that God told you not to do and you got a broken down temple and it's your own fault. Let no man deceive himself. Oh, look at that. Never mind deceivers and wolves in the back. Yourself. If any man among you seem to be wise in, the, in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. Now, what is that? Remember back here we said in chapter 1, verses 18 to 25, about being a fool with a message? Carrying out as a fool the powerful message when people look at you like an idiot and at Jesus and that church service. Paul just told you with chapter 3, with chapter 2, you get out there and tell people about Jesus. You be that fool. You take that powerful message and you go into the world. That's how you're going to get these rewards. Doing something for God. For the wisdom of the world is foolishness with God. God looks at these doctors, PhDs, and these scientists, and all these brag abouts with college education. All God said, you don't know nothing. Sometimes I wonder if God's going to have a test for these idiots. It's a great white throne judgment. Mr. Scientist of Efficacy and Evolution, explain this and hold a platypus by his tail. Explain it. Mr. Theistic Evolution, explain this and have a whale. It's a fish, but it, it but it gives live birth and it has milk. Come on, explain it. Explain it. How about a frog? A frog. Hey, explain this one. It can be both sexes to, to, to increase its population. Explain it. And God knows it all. And yet, yeah, you're so magnificent. So oriented so wonderful in wisdom you couldn't believe my son and i'm going to cast you off into hell in a couple seconds for it is written he taketh the wise in their own craftiness god got him and again the lord knows the thoughts of the wise that they are vain How's that? Therefore, let no man glory in men. I'm a Paul. I'm a Paulist. Knock it off. You may have the wisest, brightest preacher. Get your eyes on God. Thank God for him. But get your eyes off men. For all things are yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, that's Peter, or the world, or life, or death, or things present, or things to come, all are yours. And ye are Christ. And Christ is God. So everything on top of everything, and on top of that pyramid is God, and just below that pyramid and top of that pyramid is God. Forget everything else, God. And when you do God, you're going to get gold, silver, precious stones. Anything else, you're going to be burned. You're going to be sorry. I always say with the, with the men at the prison, as often I taught this, when the judgment seat of Christ is set for, it's going to be heavenly smoke detectors going off like crazy. And they're going to be down on their knees, not worshiping Jesus Christ. They're going to be down on their knees in the ashes trying to find a little ruby, a little diamond. And there will be none. And you can plead to God all you want, but you ain't going to get a second chance. God's not like that. God is a holy, righteous judge. You haven't done anything today. Start today. Get out there. Do something for God and stay on the train. Lord's coming. He's coming very soon.